Is God personal or impersonal? And the real answer is really short. It's yes. But <laughs> if I left it at that and sat down, Shurju and Ariani probably wouldn't invite me back. And I might lose them as friends. So I'll have to explain a little bit more. But in fact, both are very important. It's not one or the other. The way that our master is taught about offering ourselves into God with deep devotional offering, but taking it beyond a personal relationship into more impersonal, true divine love, and eventually into divine bliss, which Yogananda described as this impersonal goal that we all strive to reach in the final divine union, which is samadhi. So we all are trying to find this balance. Sometimes we go too far in one direction, and some souls do too intellectual, too much. You know, they see pain and suffering, and they just say, as Swami Kriyanandaji used to joke, all is Ram, all is Ram. When they see someone else suffering, all is God, and it's this very non-dualistic thing. But when they start feeling pain, rather than saying all is Ram, they say, ouch, ouch, I'm hurting. And so that's an intellectual approach, and we are, in a sense, required before we find final freedom to develop this also compassion, compassionate approach, kindness, devotion. And so it's these two ways that really almost work together, dancing together until we find final freedom. For those who tend to only go in one way, the greatest sort of teacher at this time, at the time of a story I'm about to tell, Adi Shankara, at that time he was the great teacher of Advaita, which is non-dualism, all is Maya. He didn't teach worship of God or Divine Mother. All was spirit, and that was it. And so he was wandering one day, going to some one of the many endless debates that they would have in those days, and he was climbing a mountain. And he was really suffering from severe dysentery. And by the time he got to the top of the mountain, he just passed out in a complete faint. He had no energy, which in the way he taught energy was Shakti. Not Shakti as Divine Mother, but just Shakti as this impersonal energy. And so he was in a dead faint. And as he was lying there, maybe about to die, he felt some water sprinkling on his face. And he opened his eyes, and there was a beautiful young girl standing over him, smiling. And then he just passed out again. He just had no energy. And he felt this sprinkling again, and he woke up, and there she was, smiling at him joyfully and pouring water on his face and trying to help him. And he passed out again. He just had no energy. And finally, a third time, he woke up, opened his eyes, and there she was, just again, smiling joyfully and givingly. And she asked him, Maharaj, what's the matter with you? And Adi Shankara looked at her and replied, I have no Shakti. I have no Shakti, meaning no energy, not meaning Divine Mother. And the girl just smiled and started laughing. And she, as she turned into a form of Divine Mother, which was Bhavani, the mother of this world, she laughed and she said, I thought you didn't believe in Shakti. And after that, he did believe in Shakti, in Divine Mother. And this is when he began apparently writing these scriptures and treatises on God as Divine Mother. And it is both, and even for all of us, it's both. When we get too far in one direction, and I'll tell some stories also about getting too far in the other direction, of having a more personal and too human kind of a love for God. Because in fact, as we progress, we must come to divine love and devotion coming from our human perspective. So we are coming from this place, and God gave us mother, father, friend, beloved, to teach us how to love. But as we progress towards divine love, it's very easily tainted by the more personal way that we've learned. And sometimes I think we can think we're practicing divine love, but really it's still the human form to some extent. But it is a direction, and we must go in that direction, and we must practice it. And I think sometimes people use that as an excuse to withdraw completely from it and just go towards the Advaita philosophy and more cold and impersonal. But again, both are necessary. Yoganandaji, he talked about these things, and I'll read something that he said. Well, I'll first read something Swami Kriyananda wrote about the fact that God is personal, and it's not 
only impersonal. And he said, God, you see, is personal in, in his relationship with you because you are personal. He descends to your level in order to draw you up to his. What he calls, to, calls you to is ultimately the impersonality of pure consciousness. At the same time, he is conscious of you individually. Where your own consciousness is concerned, he is you. And so God manifested as each one of us. And for anyone who says that God is impersonal, I see about maybe 40, 45 personal aspects of God because God did descend into this form into each one of us. We came from God. So there is a personal aspect without any doubt. And so we do need this relationship and this personal aspect to some extent to merge back into God by offering ourselves in this personal way because God gave us this whole incarnation being born in these forms as aspects of God to learn from and to grow back into divine union which is samadhi bliss, the way that Yogananda talked about it. And so we talked yesterday at our Kriyaban uh, workshop about these two feeling aspects of God, love and bliss. Yogananda, he once said that really one should seek God as bliss primarily and as love secondarily. Because what he said was that the other side of it is, is that if we too much and only seek God with this personal and human approach, it, it can become too personal. And as long as we're still trying to go up the spine or up the, the pathway to the divine and uplift it into this higher aspect, there's still a downward pull and a temptation or a tendency, memory, assumption to make it more personal and to think that this personal love is the divine kind of love. And I'll tell a story that is an example of this which is that many of us, I think, have heard this story. Swamiji told it very often of Radha and Krishna. And the gopis were dancing and celebrating with Krishna. And Radha, at one point, Krishna picked up Radha in his arms and started carrying her around. And she had this thought of, in that moment, oh, the Lord loves me especially, and with the emphasis on me. And that made it too personal and too human. And she was bringing it down to a human level. And I think we've all done it at times. I think we've all had a grace or a blessing from God. And we think, oh, God loves me with the emphasis on me. And so at that point, God pulls away a little bit. And what happened at this point is that Krishna vanished. And Radha just fell to the ground in a heap. And I can imagine she just smashed into the ground. Because she was a great devotee and also very wise, she understood right away, OK. I was loving the Lord much too personally and thinking he and me with the emphasis again on me. And Krishna reappeared and was with her again because she understood. Yet we must also, as you see with these gopis, they did use that I and thou relationship with the Lord to find their way to divine freedom. And so this is the way to God. Yoganandaji, in his autobiography of a yogi, in the chapter on having an experience of cosmic consciousness, he wrote about describing this whole experience and how you have that experience. And this is an experience of God as bliss, which again, he said, is an impersonal aspect of God, still a feeling aspect, because we sometimes think that impersonal means cold and without feeling. And yet divine bliss is the most intense, pure form of feeling that there is. And so this goal of life, uh, according to the yogis, is to merge back into God as bliss, and really into ourselves as bliss, because we were never separate from bliss. We were made from that bliss. And yet, by practicing devotion, we get to that point. Swamiji, I quoted him yesterday as saying one time that love is the first manifestation of bliss, and that the reason that devotion and love are so enjoyable is that word enjoy, which is joy that there's a, a touch of divine bliss and joy underneath devotion and love that we feel. And he said that in that chapter, in Autobiography of a Yogi, he said that this experience of samadhi only comes when the devotee opens our heart through intense devotional bhakti. And that devotion eventually draws 
the grace and the help of God because we don't get there by ourselves. We only put out the effort to cooperate with divine grace, but then it's divine grace that finally lifts us up in the end. And in that chapter, it's only God through his guru that came to Yoganandaji and touched him on the heart and gave him that experience. And he didn't give that experience because Yoganandaji was being a good boy and was some reward for being good. In fact, he had left his guru for almost a year or more and finally came back, was meditating, was having a really bad meditation. So in no way was he being a good boy and being patted on the head or touched on the, uh, touched on the heart. It, was, it wasn't a reward. It was simply that he had been making the effort, practicing meditation and devotion when the timing was right. In God's timing, that touch came. And so our part simply is to keep practicing these things, developing true love for God in the highest sense, not taking it personally, offering ourselves into that light, purifying, giving, serving. And we'll find that in God's timing, it will be right. It's just like a ripe fruit dropping from a tree. And that fruit comes very interestingly, not by demanding that it come. And this is part of this whole process. It really comes when we give, and give ourselves and offer ourselves to God with devotion as a way of giving rather than just demanding and asking. Yes, we also must demand and ask at times, and we'll talk about that in our class here after the, the satsang. But it's through giving that eventually we open our heart and attract divine grace and receive it more easily, just like a tree. I've been a gardener for many years, and when you plant a fruit tree, you don't just start shaking your fist or your finger and saying, start giving me fruit. I demand you give me fruit. Come to me now as fruit. No, you only give. You can't demand. You can only give. You water it. You love the plant. You protect it. You fertilize it. You give, give, give to it. And then in the right time, even then, you can't, after five years, start scolding it for not giving fruit. You're supposed to give fruit by now. It's been five years. No, you just lovingly give to it, offer yourself in its service with joy, with freedom. And when the timing is right, the fruit will come. And even the fruit, as it's ripening, you can't start saying, come on, hurry up, I'm getting impatient. Ripen, ripen. And I think we've all experienced this. You're impatient for a fruit. I have experienced this. Maybe others haven't. But you take it off the tree, and it's not ripe yet, and it's sour, and it doesn't taste good. And so you just have to wait. In God's own timing, that freedom will come. And I think part of that timing is just us learning as we go along how to be divine children and giving in that right way. At the same time, we also do have to pray intensely to God. Yoganandaji talked about this so often, praying to Divine Mother in this reading today of praying, crying to Divine Mother, come to me, come to me now. And just balance these two. If it's only crying and demanding, yeah, the mother will start to give us more and more playthings to distract us. This baby's just crying all the time. Let me just give it something and I'll go pay attention to some of my other 10 gazillion children, because you have to realize that when we take it too personally, and it's just about me, really it's about us, all of us, because we're all part of the divine, and she has a lot of children to take care of, and when we just think it's me, 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 that's when it starts to become too personal. Yet we also have to do that. We've come from this personal, individualized spirit, so we do have to pray in that way and demand to God. But don't accept the playthings, as this reading today suggested. I had this experience once where, maybe I've shared this before, but I was going through a lot of challenges with my health and such. And I was doing a lot of traveling in the United States, doing programs on Kriya Yoga and these things. And air, airplane flights in the US, very often because I lived in California and I was flying to the East Coast, the flights would go through Las Vegas. And Las Vegas, as I think everybody knows, is this big party gambling town. And a couple times I'd get on a flight after this uplifting, beautiful Kriya program, and people were already starting to get drunk on the plane and getting ready for the, the time of their life in Las Vegas. And it was such a contrast that it was very painful, actually, for me at times, because I was in a very vulnerable state. And on one of these trips, I just prayed to Divine Mother. I said, Divine Mother, and this flight was going through Las Vegas. I said, Divine Mother, I just want to see you in one person, in one place, 
on this flight, please. Because I had all these flights that were just very dry in that way. And so as soon as I got on the flight, this baby started crying really, really loudly. And it was a very tiny baby. It must have been only weeks old, a few weeks maybe, by the size of it. And it was very nearby me. And it was crying so loud. And it never stopped for three hours. <laughs> and in fact, actually, I'm not, not quite right. It stopped every 10, 15 seconds to take a deep breath and start crying again. <laughs> it just kept going on and on and on. And because of my state of mind, I was, I was very receptive. I was, I was looking for Divine Mother, because we can't just say, Divine Mother, come to me, and then ignore her and just start looking the other way. I was looking for her. I was looking everywhere and listening. And as I listened to this baby, I was listening to, what is this baby saying as it's crying? Because I could feel that there was something there. It was a brand new soul come to this earth. And the parents were doing everything. You know, ga ga, goo goo, smiling and making funny faces and handing it bright, shiny objects. And it, it never stopped crying. And I tried to listen to what it was saying. I really felt and believe that it was saying, I want God. I, I came from this beautiful place in the lap of Divine Mother, and now I'm flying to Las Vegas with all these people. <laughs> and I don't want this. I want to go home. And nothing you give to me is going to distract me and keep me from crying nonstop for three hours. And I really almost was tempted to go up to that baby and whisper in its ears, don't stop crying. Don't let these people distract you. <laughs> Keep crying for the rest of your life because that's what it takes. And so don't be distracted by lesser things. Even this Yogananda Ji called it the divine romance, this lover and beloved, this way that we love God. And he said that even advanced yogis will have this relationship with God in a very deep way, even for a few lifetimes, just to enjoy the relationship of I and thou. But he said ultimately even that is not satisfying to them. In the end, they have to merge and become one with God. And so when we do pray and meditate, do it more with a sense of not having any separation from I and thou. The way that Swami Kriyanandaji put it, he said when you pray, don't pray to God, pray in God. When you meditate, don't meditate on God, meditate in God. And you will find that when you practice it in this way, it's much more satisfying because the personal approach, there's always not only a little bit of separation, but there is a little bit, bit of ego still there because it's me and thou rather than just thou only. And so when we meditate and pray, really pray to go back, to go back into merging in God. I was at a, a temple recently in Chennai. It was a Divine Mother temple that actually was founded by Adi Shankara. It's the Kamakshi temple down there. And it was a very, very powerful place. I just, the murti was very powerful and we had some very blessed time early in the morning when hardly anyone was there. And as I was meditating on it, it began with this feeling, this great power coming from Divine Mother represented in this form. But then we meditated for some time, sitting right there. And then I just tried to practice this, what I'm, what I'm talking about, of just feeling that I was, she was in me and I was in her. And in that sense, there was all of this, suddenly this great feeling of expansion, of becoming one with her in the whole universe, beyond form. And it wasn't, I wasn't in some samadhi experience, so I'm not talking about some great spiritual experience here. But it was a feeling of being in grace, of being in God in a very expansive way and not having any separation. So even when we meditate or pray in God, rather than even feeling that God is in me, because again, it's, there's still me, that God is in me. And that, that even, it can be a temptation actually. Uh, Swami, Swamiji said that the last great final test on the spiritual path, and perhaps the most difficult one, is when you start to have the experience of samadhi, but the lesser samadhi where you become one with God and then come back to your little self. And that test is great because you come back to your little self and you think, wow, I, I am one with God, again with the emphasis on I. And then you get through that and finally this final merging with God 
as divine bliss. And so this is really the route that we're following. We need to have the open heart because grace comes when our heart is open. And so we need to practice, to some extent, this personal relationship to God as the guru, as divine mother, but also try to take it even further than that. Try to see God in every single person. This has been something that has been a practice of mine for many years. And it began actually my first year at Ananda because I was trying to become a hermit before that. And I thought that people were an extreme hindrance on the spiritual path. And so I had needed to get away from people. So I went and became a hermit and lived up in the mountains in California. And I find that the one person I couldn't get away from was myself, <laughs> my restless self and this and that. So I came to Ananda, I found my guru. But still I had this obstacle of people and I just was tending to shy away from being around people because they disturbed my calmness and they disturbed my meditation. And they disturbed my peace. It wasn't about me. And I realized that, well, yeah, it was about me. And so to get over it, I practiced an affirmation for a few years, very strongly and powerfully, which was, I will radiate love and goodwill to others that I may open a channel for God's love to come to all. And it's a very interesting affirmation because a later editor of Yoganandaji's actually changed the words because either she felt it was grammatically or spiritually incorrect. But it completely changed the meaning in a way that really highlights what we're talking about. Rather than saying that I, that I may open a channel for God's love to come to all, she changed it to God's love to come to me. And it just turned the focus on me. And I think maybe she thought it was grammatically incorrect to say, come to all. But when you think, you know, because it should come to me or go to all. But I think she was thinking uh, opposite of what Yogananda, which is, comes to all of us, and we are all one, and we are all aspects of God. And so try to see God in all. Try also to worship God in form, but use that worship to take us even deeper beyond form into this more deeper aspect of God, which is God as divine bliss. And again, Yoganandaji said, seek God as bliss, love secondarily, but also use love and devotion to expand our consciousness in the ways I'm talking about so that, yes, we can eventually merge into and find God as divine bliss. Let me read something else that, on that line, the true goal of spiritual development is transcendence, particularly of the ego. For this reason, it is better to love God as bliss above all, for the very nature of bliss is impersonal. Love's true fulfillment in any case is bliss. It is safer and wiser, therefore, to make love a secondary goal in the quest for God. And I'm going to end with a reading a poem by Yoganandaji from his Whispers from Eternity. And this poem, I think, describes in a very good way the path that we should all follow. And it's not just a poem, it's also a great teaching. And the story of the poem is called My Devotion. O thou mother of all conscious things, be thou consciously receptive to my prayers. Through thee I know all that I know, and thou knowest all I know, so thou knowest my prayers. And knowing and feeling thee constantly thus, I know that thou art I, and I am thou. My little wavelet has vanished in thee. I know thee alone as all existence. Thou alone art the ever existent. Thou dost exist now, and thou shalt be evermore. Thou art impersonal, invisible, unseen, formless, omnipresent. But thou art also personal through my love. Forever I want to worship thee as both personal and impersonal. By my devotion I have beheld thee, sometimes as Krishna, sometimes as Christ, personal, visible, and imprisoned in little forms, and hidden within the little temple of my love. O invisible one, as thou didst freeze part of thine unseen infinitude in the arctic, arctic ice of finitude, 
so do thou appear unto me, visible and living, that I may serve thee always. I want to see thee as the ocean of all life, both with and without the ripples of creation. O creator of all things, I want to worship thee as everything. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.